Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and the warmest of welcomes to Sea Fever. Sea Fever is North Norfolk's festival of poetry and prose and I'm speaking to you from Wells Maltings. That's a wonderful facility we have here on this exquisite coast. I'm here this evening to introduce you to Ursula Buckham, but for many of you she will need no introduction. She's hugely well known through her gardening telegraph in the Daily Telegraph and for the many books that she has written on that subject. But that name, Buchan, Buchan, John Buchan, and of course Ursula, again, as many of you will know, is in fact John Buchan, the great Scottish writer. She is his granddaughter. And about 18 months ago, she published an outstanding new biography of the man called, and you can guess why, I'm sure, Beyond the 39 Steps. It's an outstanding work, and it tells us, of course, about the man. It tells us about the writer, but it tells us a great deal about his multifaceted life. I'm not going to tell you any more now, because Ursula introduces John in some detail in the first minutes of this film. But I am going to say that the book is so good that I must recommend that you go out and buy it immediately the film is over. Thank you, Ursula Buchan. Enjoy. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you at the Sea Fever Festival. I'm only sorry that I'm not with you in the flesh, but I hope no nevertheless you'll find my talk of some interest. John Buchan, my grandfather, has been dead for 80 years, yet he's achieved that rare thing, literary immortality. While writing my biography of him, I discovered that there's still a deep res residual admiration and affection for his books in this country and indeed across the Atlantic as well. The fact that you've signed up for this talk is evidence of that. So why is this? Of course, I can't know for certain, but a number of possible reasons spring to mind. JB, as his family and friends called him and his descendants still call him, seems to have been the gateway writer for many children learning to enjoy reading. At almost every event where I speak, someone will tell me afterwards how important he was in giving them a love of reading books when they were young, a love they've never lost. Another reason must surely be that he understood and expressed so well what it feels like to be Scottish. That's very important to Scots, even holiday Scots like me, who, to paraphrase Robert Louis Stevenson, remember and cherish the memory of their forebears, good and bad, and inside whom burns a sense of identity with, with those forebears, even to the 20th generation. Born without money or privilege, John Buchan made his way in the world in a fashion which does honour both to him and to Scotland. And he showed Scotland and the Scots to the world, as Sir Walter Scott had done before him, explaining its, his, its past, dwelling on its character, delighting in its eccentricities, marvelling at its natural beauty. At the same time, his marriage to an Englishwoman and the fact that he made his home in England meant that he had dual and equal loyalties. So English people believe he belongs to them as well. It must also be that he's an inspiration. He lived a supremely energetic life, full of good works, much of it at the heart of public life, despite chronic illness, and was sincerely mourned by millions when he died, most of whom had never met him. Finally, much of what he wrote still speaks to us today, if we'll listen. John Buchan wrote more than 100 books, including 27 novels, six substantial biographies, a monumental 24 volume contemporary account of the First World War, three works of political thought, and a legal textbook. There were also dozens of poems and short stories, and about a thousand articles for newspapers and magazines. Although his stories are of variable quality, no one can speak too highly of his elegant, graceful prose. It's sometimes light-hearted, witty, even satirical, while at others lyrical, humane, and deeply felt. He was also a scholar, a bibliophile, an antiquarian, and at various times a barrister, colonial administrator, journal editor, literary critic, publisher, war correspondent, director of wartime information, member of parliament, and governor general of Canada. He was a sparkling conversationalist and a very good friend, 
especially to those in trouble. He was a devoted family man, supported and buoyed up by a lifelong happy marriage. And he did everything he did while suffering from really debilitating illness for most of his adult life. However, when I embarked on my biography of him five years ago, I was painfully conscious that thanks to the monumentally successful The 39 Steps and its various film versions, the multifarious nature of this remarkable polymath was fading in the public memory. In some people's minds, he'd become simply the junior partner to the great Alfred Hitchcock. And I was fearful his achievements and his unique personality would be lost to public sight. And that's why I determined, a generation after the last full-length biography was published, to write another. And this determination was underpinned by the knowledge that masses of scholarly research had been done on him in the intervening years. Scholarship which was hidden away in unpublished PhDs and specialist journal articles. These, I felt, should see the light of common day. As a direct descendant, I was brought up with a semi-mythic sense of John Buchan. He was a great man, of that no one around me doubted, yet somehow a mysterious one. This sense of mystery was, if anything, deepened by the memoirs written by three of his children, all of whom shone light on some facets of his character while ignoring others. As I got down to research, I had to brush my way through the undergrowth, cutting down here, preserving there, in order to try to reach what I considered a proper balanced picture of the man. I recognized early on that I must be careful not to allow my blood connection to get in the way. Sharing a quarter of my genes with him could be a great advantage. For example, I saw a lot of family correspondence never published before, but it could also be a real drawback. I determined that the book would be no hagiography, that I would view John Buchan's life in a dispassionate way, not over-egging his successes and virtues, and certainly not ignoring his failures and failings. Family loyalty really hasn't prevented me from confronting his flaws and reverses with a historian's unblinking eye. Of course, you'll have to read the book to see if I've succeeded. This is a slide of him aged about 60, no more than five foot eight inches tall, neat and dapper in dress, with a spare frame, keenly intelligent face, deep set blue gray eyes, an aquiline nose, a thin but not mean mouth, a prominent mole on his chin and a domed forehead on the left side of which was a large scar and bump. As a child, he must have had a strong Fife accent but he replaced it at university in England with a rather strangely strangulated so-called Kensington voice with just a hint of Scots in the rolled R's. If you want to see and hear him, just type into YouTube the words, John Buchan, Governor General of Canada, broadcast New, Year, New Year's message, 1938. You'll get the idea. He was born in Perth in 1875, the eldest child of the Reverend John Buchan, a minister of the Free Church of Scotland, and his wife Helen, who came from a line of Scottish border sheep farmers. She bore him six children, four boys and two girls, between 1875 and 1894. When John was a few months old, the family moved to an industrial parish in Path Head, on the coast of Fife. Next slide. His childhood was a happy one, recalled at the beginning of two novels, Prester John and the Free Fishers. However, at the age of about five, he was nearly killed after falling from a carriage and he lay unconscious for a week. He had to spend six months in bed while his skull mended, not allowed to read or exert himself, which may well have helped to turn him into a highly imaginative little boy, as well as one with reserves of patience and optimism. That's where the bump and scar on his forehead came from. His summers were spent at Broughton Green in Broughton in the Upper Tweed Valley, home to his mother's family. His father came from nearby Peebles. And these holidays proved hugely important in developing his imagination, since the Tweed Valley is the mythical home of the Celtic political leader Merlin, as well as being a haunt of border reavers in the Middle Ages 
and a place of vicious religious conflicts in the 17th century. The Jacobite army marched past the door of Broughton Green in 1745 on their ill-fated journey to Derby. And with his brothers and sister all alone, JB wandered freely and far over the hills and fished in the tributaries of Tweed. This country and the proud people that inhabited it haunted his memory and informed his fiction all his life. When JB was 13, his admirable father was appointed minister of the John Knox Church in the Gorbals district of Glasgow. The family moved to the suburb of Cross Hill, two miles away. John attended Hutchison's Grammar School in the Gorbals, achieving a scholarship a year later, which gave him a free place. Here he is in a school photograph of 1891, second from the right on the back row. He then won a bursary to the University of Glasgow and went up aged 17 in 1892. This was a most formative time for him when he learned the discipline of hard work and spent what leisure time he had writing essays, some of which were published in magazines and made him useful money. There were also short stories, poetry, and his first novel, Sir Quixote of the Moors, one you may possibly not have heard of. Here's the family in the summer of 1892. Anna and John Junior and Senior at the back, Walter, Helen Buchan, Violet and Willie in the front. Little Violet on her mother's lap, looking like a wraith, died of a stomach complaint the following year when she was five, much to everyone's sorrow. JB's family was close knit and loving, but he wasn't shielded from the problems and duties of a slum parish. As a teenager, he taught a Sunday school for boys. And the Gorbals diehards, who were a gang of tough and resourceful street children, were to become one of his best loved of his fi fictional creations, appearing in Hunting Tower and other novels. In 1895, aged 20, JB left Glasgow University after three years without taking a degree because he'd won a scholarship to Brasenose College, Oxford. It was a fateful decision. He never lived permanently in Scotland again. He made some very close friends at Oxford, amongst them Raymond Asquith, son of H.H. H. Asquith, and the dashing Aubrey Herbert, the model for Sandy Arbuthnot in his fiction. But he didn't neglect old Scottish companions either. He seems to have had the knack of choosing his friends from among the brightest and best, although few of them had had such a striving start in life and therefore the ambition of this middle-class Scot. He was elected president of the Oxford Union in 1898. Here's the Union Committee. JB is second on the left middle row, with his hands on the shoulders of a Scottish friend, Johnny Jamison. JB won the University Prize for both history and poetry and gained a first in grades. He even achieved an entry in Who's Who, where his occupation was given as undergraduate. JB had acquired the confidence and as well now the financial independence to go to London to read for the bar in early 1900. At the same time, he contributed articles to The Spectator and published two more novels. However, in late 1901, aged just 26, he joined Lord Milner's staff, helping in the reconstruction of South Africa towards the end of the Second Boer War. JB was an early member of the so-called kindergarten, hand-picked young men who answered only to Lord Milner. One of his tasks was to try to halt the terrible spread of disease and the horrifying death toll concentration camps of Boer and native women and children, once the army had handed them over to the civilian authorities. In that, he and his colleagues were pretty successful, spurred on by public anger about the scandal back home. He was also involved in land settlement and amelioration, trying to resettle the Boers back on their farms after the war ended in May 1902. This meant he travelled extensively on horseback between the Cape and the Limpopo re regions and grew to love South Africa, writing both non-fiction and fiction set there. On his return to London in late 1903, he took up his old pursuits of the bar and journalism, becoming at one point deputy editor of The Spectator under St. Lowe Strachey. He had an active social life, 
often spent in English country houses and a large acquaintance. But it wasn't until he met Susan Grosvenor in 1905 that his heart was seriously touched. She was six years younger than him, the elder of two daughters of Norman and Caroline Grosvenor, as her father was chairman of Sun Life Insurance, which doesn't seem to have taken up much of his time. He was a very keen amateur musician and composer, and her mother was an artist and later a novelist. Susan spent much of her childhood at Moor Park, her grandfather Lord Ebury's Palladian house set in a Capability Brown landscape in Hertfordshire. It's now a very grand golf clubhouse, as you can see, and I'm not sure my grandmother would have appreciated the tarmac. But there wasn't much money, both because her father was a younger son and because he died when Susie was only 16. She was highly intelligent and read very widely for a girl of her class. She was cultured and well-traveled. However, her formal education was decidedly sketchy. And when I was offered a place at Cambridge, she wrote to congratulate me and told me how much she envied me the opportunity to go to university. She would certainly have benefited. Fortunately, when the couple became engaged in November 1906, her family had the sense to see that John Buchan, although not born into her milieu, was very much the rising man. In fact, he was to prove a great deal more distinguished than any of her own close relations. And there's no doubt the couple loved each other. I've seen the letters. They were married in the summer of 1907, and Susie liked the Buchan family very much especially JB's sister, Anna, who was soon to make a career as a popular novelist of Scottish domestic life under the pseudonym O. Douglas. And despite Susie's grand English ways, it, it is said that my grandmother never learned how to boil an egg or sew on a button. The Buckens became equally fond of her. He now had needed a reliable income, so he gave up the bar and most journalism and accepted an offer from his Oxford friend, Tommy Nelson to become a partner in his family publishing company, Thomas Nelson and Sons, with offices in Edinburgh and London, working as an editor and literary advisor. In the course of this work, he became highly attuned to public taste, a very useful thing for a popular writer who already had some novels under his own belt. In 1911, he gained the unionist candidacy for the usually liberal constituency of Peebles and Selkirk. This required a great deal of travelling and pressurised speaking engagements and may well have been the trigger for increasing stomach troubles which were to dog him all his life. He wasn't an ardent party man, always very keen to see someone else's point of view, and he championed liberal causes like free trade, old age pensions, women's suffrage and reform of the House of Lords. But on the question of Ireland, he was a staunch unionist. That year, his father died, worn out by overwork. And in 1912, his brother, Willie, an up and coming Indian civil servant, came home on leave, ill with an unknown infection. He died a few weeks later in a Glasgow nursing home. The family's sorrows were piling up. In August 1914, the family took a house in Broadstairs on the coast of Kent. The Great War had just broken out. JB was unfit for military service and his daughter Alice had just had a dangerous operation for mastoiditis. He was rightly very anxious about what would happen to Nelson's The Publishing Company during the war. And here he is on that holiday with Alice and his eldest son, Johnny. It was at Broadstairs that he began to write The 39 Steps while sick in bed. He finished it in six weeks. He wrote his shockers, as he called them, for recreation as well as later for money, and he never made any claims that they had literary merit, probably because he found them so easy to write. The dedication in the book is to Tommy Nelson, and in it he defines the shocker as, and I quote, a romance where the incidents defy the probabilities and march just inside the borders of the possible. The 39 Steps certainly defies the probabilities. It was published by Blackwoods in October 1915, when it was an immediate critical and commercial success, selling 25,000 copies in the first six weeks. The book became ideal reading for men in the army, 
short, pithy, exciting, escapist, describing how one man helps to save a nation's defence secrets. An attractive idea to men stuck in the trenches. JB always said that Richard Hanney was partly modelled on Lieutenant Edmund Ironside, later Field Marshal Lord Ironside, who JB had met in South Africa, and who was a great linguist and a very good intelligence officer. But Hanney is in some ways the average man, which Ironside definitely was not, who knows his limitations, and thus is someone with whom readers can readily identify. JB went on to write four more Hanny books, as well as other adventure stories featuring Edward Leithen, the bachelor lawyer, or Dixon McCunn, the businesslike but romantic grocer from Glasgow. And they're still the best books I've ever found to read when ill in bed. True, some of the language is dated, as you'd expect. There's some casual racial stereotyping of the sort that was completely commonplace a hundred years ago, which makes us cringe. But the wonder is, not that the language and mores are sometimes dated, but how much still feels fresh, even contemporary. For example, in the summer of 2005, a radio play of Greenmantle, the second Hanny book published in 1916, was pulled temporarily by the BBC because JB's account of Islamic Jihad seemed far too close to the truth for comfort in the aftermath of the 7-7 bombing. To help keep the Nelson printing presses going in wartime, JB wrote a history of the war, almost as it was happening. Published in 24 volumes, it ran to more than a million words. He spent a lot of time in France and Flanders, first for a short period as the Times' correspondent in 1915, and then drafting dispatches and communiques at Field Marshal Haig's GHQ in France in 1916. He was commissioned into the Intelligence Corps, initially with the rank of second lieutenant, and travelled extensively over the battlefields. In early 1917, however, he was recalled to London by Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, to create a Department of Information and become its director, answerable only to the War Cabinet. This department was designed to provide publicity and information, what was known pretty neutrally in those days as propaganda, for distribution in allied and neutral countries. The War Cabinet were especially keen to counter what they considered the mendacity of German propaganda in the United States. The department commissioned films, such as the hard-hitting Battle of the Somme, and it employed war artists like Muirhead Bone, Paul Nash, William Alpen, Stanley Spencer and Richard Nevinson, who were given a remarkably free hand and as a result produced some of the greatest art of the early 20th century. A number of JB's closest friends were killed in the war, notably Raymond Asquith, the son of the ex-Prime Minister. But the worst day of those years for him was the 9th of April 1917, when both his beloved youngest brother Alistair, aged 22, of the 6th Battalion the Royal Scots Fusiliers, and his very good friend and business partner Tommy Nelson, were killed at the Battle of Arras, within half a mile of each other. This picture of Alistair was painted posthumously, by the war artist, William Alpen. And here is, is his mother visiting the grave at Duisson in 1919, before the permanent gravestones were erected. The trauma of the First World War and the loss of his friends had a profound and lasting effect on JB. Despite his public commitments, he had continued the adventures of Richard Hanney and friends, even in wartime, with Green Mantle, and then Mr. Stanfast. In early 1918, the department was finally made into a ministry headed by the politician, Lord Beaverbrook. After the war, John, Buchan and Susie decided to move to the country and they bought Elsfield Manor, a rather ugly but comfortable stone house in a small village on the ridge east of Oxford. Here it is from the street, complete with blue pluck. It had links with Dr Samuel Johnson, whom JB admired, while its stable yard had been used as a gun park by Oliver Cromwell's troops. These things naturally resonated with such a highly tuned historical sensibility as JB's. The surrounding countryside was as full of echoes as Tweedale, 
and he used it as the setting for two of his very best historical novels, Midwinter and The Blanket of the Dark. The Bockens had 15 very happy years at Ellsfield. Here's the family in about 1922. John Bucken, Alice, Johnny at the back, Susie, with Alistair and my father William in the front. I love JB's gaiters, which were necessary because the Ellsfield roads weren't tarmacked. And what ugly women's fashions there were in the 1920s. By this time, as a result entirely of his own efforts, JB could afford a crowd of servants, although in other ways, the Buckens lived pretty modestly. It was a supremely disciplined and busy life, with JB commuting most days by train to London to work at Thomas Nelson's. He was also director of Reuters, the press agency. He wrote his novels and biographies at weekends, when he wasn't going for immensely long walks, that is. He was also an excellent amateur field naturalist, although it must be said that his eldest son, Johnny, was even better. Here they are at Ellsfield in the early 1930s. JB has a kestrel on his fist, while Johnny has his goshawk called Jezebel. JB was elected as one of the Conservative and Unionist MPs for the Scottish Universities in 1927. His political career was not the conspicuous success that might have been expected. He'd never been a dogmatic party man, as I've said, and it was never certain he'd be picked for a high office. His poor health was against him for a start, and his elbows were not sharp enough. He had no gift for intrigue, and found other people's intriguing impossible to counter. He did act as an important friend and advisor both to his boss, Stanley Baldwin, and to the socialist Ramsay MacDonald, once he became Prime Minister of a national government in 1931. Another achievement was his lobbying in Parliament for a British Film Institute, of which he became one of the founder governors, two years before he even met Alfred Hitchcock. In 1932, he was made a Companion of Honour for his services to literature. The following year, and in 1934, he was appointed Lord High Commissioner to the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland in Edinburgh, the King's representative, staying at the Palace of Holyrood House for 10 days in May. And here he is with his wife in an open landau on the way to open the assembly in 1934, complete with an escort of Royal Scots Greys. It is a delicious irony that the closer to the centre of political and public life JB became, the more hectic and irresponsible were the activities of his characters in the fiction he wrote at the same time. It was absolutely necessary for him to escape into a world of romance as a counterweight to all the worthy enterprises in which he was engaged. And since all experience was grist to him, you'll be interested to know that Norfolk appears in at least two of his novels. You'll find a description of what he calls the Hannam Flats, probably Burnham, in his novel, The Island of Sheep. And the climax of the Free Fishers takes place at a country house he calls Overy Hall, only a step from the North Sea across the mud flats and saltings. The Free Fishers was published in 1934 and The Island of Sheep in 1936. And a few years earlier, John Buchan's name appeared in the guest book of the Moorings Hotel in Burnham Overy Stave. In 1934, JB, by now a very popular writer, was approached by Alfred Hitchcock, who wanted to buy the option to film The 39 Steps. They agreed very modest terms. 800 pounds, and it was made by Gaumont British for 60,000 pounds. Charles Bennett, who wrote the screenplay, thought the novel was terrible. Nevertheless, The 39 Steps made Hitchcock's name in America for the first time when it came out in 1935. Much of the plot was changed to reflect the different international situation 20 years on from 1915. Hanny, played by Robert Donat, acquires a reluctant female companion, Pamela, played by the beautiful Madeleine Carroll. And, but despite the differences between book and film, JB told the head of Gaumont British that he thought it a great improvement on the book. The man had never heard an author say such a thing before. In 1935, 
JB was appointed Governor General of Canada. The Prime Minister of Canada, William Lyon Mackenzie King, pressed for his appointment because he admired him, but also because he was Scots, low church, and didn't have a title. However, King George V wasn't having any of that and insisted on him being elevated to the peerage as the first Baron Tweedsmuir of Ellsfield. And here he is in all, all his ceremonial finery. Lord and Lady Tweedsmuir sailed for Canada in October 1935. And here is where they mostly lived, Rideau Hall in Ottawa. As a result of his appointment, JB had to give up negotiating film deals for the novels. And he was also supposed to confine himself in speeches to what he called governor generalities, which he found it impossible always to keep to. He could never be a cardboard cutout or stuffed dummy. Whatever he was doing had to have substance to it. And it got him into trouble with Buckingham Palace from time to time. On the positive side, Canada invigorated and enchanted him. He travelled more widely than any other Governor General had done before him, including making a remarkable trip by train, small aeroplane and boat beyond the Arctic Circle in the summer of 1937. And here he is at his favourite leisure activity, salmon fishing. The success of his major trips owed much to his lack of ceremony and pomposity. Everywhere, people were charmed by his curiosity, his knowledge, his modesty, and his lack of patronizing condescension. His wife was popular too. He was made an honorary chief of several native Canadian tribes. Because he was the king's representative, the chiefs, the chiefs were prepared to treat him as an equal. At the Governor General's summer residence, the Citadel in Quebec City, he entertained Franklin D. Roosevelt, President of the United States, who'd sailed there whilst on holiday in July 1936. The two men became firm friends. Here they are on the terrace overlooking St. Lawrence River. JB, the Prime Minister, William Lyon Mackenzie King, whom the Tweedsmuirs referred to privately as Mr. Micawber, then FDR and his son James. JB and FDR corresponded frequently, and in April 1937, JB was invited to Washington, addressed both houses of Congress, the first Britain ever to do so, and privately discussed with FDR the possibility of the president calling a Washington Conference of World Leaders to try to avert the looming war in Europe. This is known to history as the Roosevelt Initiative. However, when FDR secretly approached Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, the latter poured freezing cold water on the scheme without consulting anyone, not even Anthony Eden, the Foreign Secretary. This high handedness contributed to Eden's resignation a month later. Who knows whether America could have frightened Hitler into backing off, but it would certainly have been worth a try. Eden, Churchill and Attlee all, all thought so. Roosevelt said to an acquaintance that, and I quote, Tweedsmuir is the best governor general that Canada has ever had. Canada declared war on Germany on the 10th of September, 1939. And JB, as commander in chief of the Canadian Armed Forces, worked hard to encourage high morale and enthusiasm for the cause. Two of his sons joined the Canadian rather than British forces. Johnny on the left, Alistair on the right. This picture is regrettably known to the more frivolous members of my family as Beam Me Up Scotty. On 6th of February 1940, JB suffered a slight stroke, hit his head and was rendered unconscious. He was rushed to Montreal by train with all the tracks cleared to let it pass, so that he could be operated on by the eminent neurosurgeon, Dr Wilder Penfield. Despite great efforts, he could not be saved. He died in Montreal on the 11th of February. He was 64. My father, who'd recently joined the RAF, read of his stroke on a newspaper poster in a London street because it took so long to decrypt the telegrams from Canada. The headline of one Canadian newspaper read simply, Beloved Viceroy Gone. 
Jamie's body lay in state in the Senate Chamber of Parliament in Ottawa, with his son Alistair taking his turn to help guard the coffin. This picture shows the coffin on a gun carriage being pulled through the streets of Ottawa by naval ratings on the way to the station after the funeral. He was cremated in Montreal and his ashes carried across the Atlantic secretly on the light cruiser HMS Orion, after which they were buried in the churchyard at Ellsfield. Joby's attributes and energetic ambition were always going to ensure a distinguished public career. Despite his modest origins, he became a confidant of great men. And years after his death, his book of reminiscences, Memory Hold the Door, was one of John F. Kennedy's favorite books and was much quoted by the American president. King George VI himself quoted him in his 1943 Christmas broadcast. He was famous enough in his lifetime to be parodied by Beachcomber and after his death by Alan Bennett. He even had a racehorse named after him. Although attractive to influential people, JB inspired most loyalty and devotion amongst ordinary men and women, the millions of avid readers of his novels, the Scots who attended his political meetings, the Canadians who came across him on, on his travels, but most of all, his staff and dependents. Four of these, butler, housekeeper, secretary and chauffeur, were prepared to leave Hearth and Home for five years to accompany him to Canada. But for all his public activities, JB considered himself foremost a man of letters, and he was a very successful one, both in terms of sales and reputation. His book on the Marquis of Montrose won the James Tate Black Memorial Prize in 1928. His portrait of Sir Walter Scott was reckoned to be the best single volume biography in the English language at the time. He was a writer of astonishing range who rarely wrote a dull sentence. He was a master at conjuring a, up a brilliantly lit scene or creating almost unbearable tension with just a few deft words. I know no better describer of landscape or weather, a most beneficent result of his Scottish upbringing. His rigorous education, sincere and lasting religious convictions, very broad sympathies and wide reading gave depth and humanity to his non-fiction, while love of romance and awry humour informed his fiction. The influence of his thrillers on the development of the British spy novel has been readily acknowledged by later spy writers like Graham Greene. Pursuit and escape, omnipresent danger, the hero not knowing who to trust and prey to paranoia, not to mention the use of new technology, all are important elements of British spy fiction and all appear in the Hanny books. Here is his gravestone in Ellsfield churchyard soon after it was installed. There are two inscriptions. One in Greek translates as Christ will prevail. The other translated from the Latin reads, here in his own earth lies a man who cultivated the muses, served his country and was loved by countless friends. It is true that John Buck never achieved real greatness in any one field, almost certainly because he spread his endeavors too widely. Nevertheless, I hope you'll agree with me that he's one of Scotland's most famous and gifted sons. And it's not surprisingly a source of enduring regret to me that he died 13 years before I was born. Nevertheless, he is an inspiration, not a word I use lightly, reminding me daily of the virtues of hard work, high principles, seriousness of purpose, courage in the face of chronic illness and perhaps above all, optimism. I'm not alone. 80 years after his death, pretty well everything he wrote is in print or available as a digital download. There's a thriving John Buchan Society, which celebrated its 40th anniversary last year, as well as a first rate small museum that called the John Buchan Story, housed in the Chambers Institution in Peebles. Academic research on his life and works is carried out in a variety of universities, here and abroad. 
There's even a John Buchan Way from Broughton to Peebles, a distance of 11 miles. You can see it in the valley below our spaniel's head. Remarkably, this is a view unchanged since he knew it and loved it as a child 130 years ago. And if you should ever find yourselves in Peeblesshire and in search of John Buchan, here is a very good place to start. Thank you.